I've actually been working and uh, living part time in South Africa for the last ten years. But the the initial trigger was that uh, Gary and myself were invited to a Jewish interbellum wedding in Zimbabwe, which is the kind of invitation you can't really refuse. And so it, it just uh, it was my my first trip to Africa, but Africa is a place that has uh, really played a very formative and crucial role in my intellectual development my whole life. It's something that, uh, for a variety of reasons, I was always drawn to. And it gave me an amazing chance to, um, to actually visit the place. And at the wedding, uh, Gary and myself, we uh, knew each other from Washington, D.C., from years back, and then from Prague, met with Dion Moss, my like co-director and our co-producer on this film. And somehow, even the, I think the seeds of this film were already there in that first meeting. Because Dion is himself a, a veteran of a lot of these scenes. Dion is, is from Cape Town originally, and he has uh, very strong memories of the first time he was ever tear gassed, the first time he was ever on a, on a demonstration, and the first time that he ever went to a punk concert. And they all somehow uh, were connected. So the conversations over the years, I think, enabled us to see, um, you know, the potential for this. This film, in particular, grew out of a, a previous film that all of us made together, which was more about radical theater in South Africa, which is maybe a bit more obvious. And I think this was just very attractive uh, for us as documentary filmmakers, also for precisely the reason it was so unknown, and that while the anti-apartheid movement uh, had been covered very extensively, no one ever touched this aspect. And you mentioned your co-director, Dion Moss. Can you talk a little bit, uh, I think people always wonder when there are two directors on a film, uh, how you kind of uh, uh, divided up your responsibilities? Were you always both there shooting everything? Did you you do some interviews and he did some interviews? How, how did that sort of divide itself? Well, I mean, this this film was actually in some ways really complicated to make. Uh, in other ways it was really simple because we just did it in a punk way. We just did it as a DIY film and we just decided this is going to happen and nothing's going to stop us. So we, we just kind of steamrolled our way through it. Uh, in terms of actual division of, of the directing, I mean, uh, Dion is a very gung-ho, very active person and does a lot of television productions has a lot of contacts, and he has a personal background with his story and with this kind of material. And Dion uh, gets involved in a lot of television productions, and he's always busy, so he, he didn't necessarily have time to, to spend a year researching all of this stuff, so I didn't know about that. Then when we actually started making it, of course, uh, Dion's production company played a, a very significant I don't know, in terms of directing, it was really a collaborative effort. I mean, I, I, Gary was also on almost all the shoots and, and played a huge role in framing how the, the story would be told. Jeffrey was with us all the way, was also always contributing ideas. So, I mean, we, we kind of made the film as a team. And again, it was, it was a DIY film, we just all did what we had to do. And, and Jeffrey, can you maybe speak a little bit more to what some of the challenges unique to this production were? Were there any issues with um, access either to subjects or to archival materials? And, and even though you did it in a DIY style, was there a certain point in which you did have to sort of find backers to come on to complete post-production and that sort of thing? Well, I think the, the core issue is just that we were in Prague and Keith was having to travel there a lot. And that we were making a film from, um, even though we were in Prague, you know, the shooting was taking place in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and in Mozambique. So just in terms of just just physical distance, that was that was a big big issue. Um, yeah, it was made on a shoestring. You know, um, the um, like a lot of documentaries, um, as, as Keith suggested before. I mean, that's the beauty of it is that you have three or four people who were all involved. So my, you know, Gary is very involved in terms of, uh, of in terms of story as a cameraman. A lot of people. Um, a lot of documentary cameramen are like that, and that's that's 
um, you know, part, part of the deal. But you know, that that was hard. We didn't have a lot of money. That was an issue. Um, one thing that was good is that we did we were able to pre-sell the film um, in Europe, which was kind of just a good stroke of luck. Which you know, I think if you go through the process of a film, you have ups and downs, and then that kind of pushed us through when that happened. It sort of came out of nowhere, and we were. I was able to negotiate it to a much higher amount that allowed us to keep going with the film. It has um, a catchy type. Yeah, yes. It was about punk music in Africa, so we called it punk in Africa. Yeah, so. um, but that was difficult. In terms of just um, also finishing the film, um, we did bring it back to Prague, and, and so there was always an issue of, of just really bringing all the material together. Um, a lot of Keith's research was, was through Facebook, so it was definitely a social media research project, which was something new, which was quite exciting. We were able to, to uh, put together a lot of materials which didn't necessarily belong to us, but uh, people stepped forward because it was an exciting, it was an exciting um, project. So um, that, uh, on the one hand, like the distance was huge. On the other hand, the distance was very small in terms of the amount of time that I would have taken to, to pull together all those articles. So a lot of those like personal archives people just donated because they were excited about the film, and um, you know I think it gets back to the original idea of do something exciting, and other people, you know, if you build it, people will come, and and you tell people you're doing a film about punk music in Africa. Very rarely do people say, oh, that's nice. People are always like, people are like, oh, really? Huh, wow. And and that's exciting, and so that I think that I think Keith was able to to really work kind of move forward with that and build off of that in terms of this social media archive search. But in terms of the archive materials, since we're speaking about that, a lot of this stuff was completely unseen. Some of the stuff in the film uh, that we found uh, in Los Angeles of the band National Way hadn't even been processed. It was just raw <laughs> rolls of eight million film sitting in the trunk somewhere. A lot of the audio archives uh, hadn't seen the light of the day and and even some of the historical materials that, that we managed to turn up were from very obscure sources. I mean, the, we did get some stuff from writers, but it's probably what, it's 19 seconds of stuff that's in the film again. It's from writers. Anything else is from personal archives, home movies, very obscure sources. The Mozambican Civil War footage, for example, was a piece of a DVR propaganda newsreel that was made in the mid-70s that we found first in the Slovak National Film Archives. And they wanted too much money for it, and so we actually found the Russian dubbed version of the same one in Prague in the Kraki Film Archives, where literally we had to go through a card catalog. The stuff we had not only not been digitized, it had not even made it into the computer. So the, really we were, we were Uncovering some very dusty traces, trying to find all this archive stuff, and that uh, that was a big challenge, but it was also exciting. I mean, when you find stuff that you know, no one has seen ever, it's, it's always exciting. It's also the producer being a total cheap bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, I want to ask you because I think you know the art of cinematography and documentaries is not often enough uh, remarked upon, and, and this really has a kind of really fascinating visual texture because there are so many different types of material, still photographs, concert footage, archival concert footage, talking head interviews. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you work with all of those different things to try to create uh, some kind of, uh, of, a, of a consistent uh, uh, tone to the film, a smoothness? Of a consistent look. Um, Keith and I actually hit on something very early on, which was uh, when got hold of the National Wake footage, which is all this wonderful, so great footage. We realized that to kind of bridge between all the old stuff, this really old, fantastic footage, and the stills, particularly, that we had to find a visual way of doing that. And so we ended up shooting a lot of our own super great film. And that became, uh, in some places, it looks like the art enough so that it's actually taken from the footage. And in other places it becomes the bridge between the archive footage and kind of the modern day footage that we also shot. So that became a, a fairly crucial element for us to be able to tie the old with the new because the great is just this wonderful kind of format that you can get away with almost anything. And it's 
And then we shot a lot of the stuff. Well, we shot it on a bunch of different formats because, you know, like we had a small camera in Zimbabwe, and so since we had to take it all apart, and everybody had a different piece. And, they, and Dion actually had a piece. And, yeah. Yeah. Dion was actually the one who got stopped by the Zimbabwe customs, and, and, and they, they opened it up. And they opened it up and said, "What is this?" And, and said, of course, it said Sony in big letters on it. Dion said, "Oh, this is actually." Uh, a new format for playing music on. Right. Uh, this is something beyond an MP3 player. We just don't have it here yet. And I said, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so just take it in with you. So we, we use kind of whatever we had. And, um, so part of it was uh, that, and a lot of it was actually the, the brilliance of Keith and, and Andy Mills, the editor, and uh, being able to make this all fit together and 